Good morning. From Matthew 22, one of them, a lawyer, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. Which one of these do we pay the most attention to in church? Heart, soul, or mind? Maybe the soul. I think maybe the heart. We talk a lot about inviting Jesus into our heart or loving each other. We may at times downplay the mind. Someone asks questions and we might say, why are you asking all these questions? Where's your faith? Don't talk about that, just believe it. I remember when Priscilla and I were first married, we were at a little church in Fall City, Washington, and we were in a small group setting with the pastor one day, and he said, I want everybody to give their testimony, kind of practice, and all sort of critique you, and I thought, great, that's just what I need, someone to critique my testimony. <laughs> and so, when it was my turn, I talked about, you know, um, I see the Bible as a manual for life, and I see God as the one who designed me and the world, and when we follow what it says in the Bible, it works out more smoothly. When we go opposite of what it says in the Bible, it's rougher, and that gives me faith that he is real. And the pastor berated me, and he said, that's not a testimony. You need to work on that. Where's the emotion? And I thought, who are you? You know, and I also thought, I'm never giving my testimony again. I'm a mechanical engineer. I think about how things are designed and how they work. I don't think about my emotions. It was kind of an example to me of somebody who was downplaying the intellectual side and saying, you know, the heart is all that matters. Not that it doesn't matter, but... How are, how are Christians portrayed in the media? What examples do we see? When you read a news article about science, if it happens to mention faith, how does it mention it? In Simpsons, remember the Simpsons? What's Homer's neighbor's name? I know you guys watch the Simpsons. <laughs> Ned Flanders, remember that guy? He's, he's a Christian. Really nice guy. Uh, he's the one that says, hi ho neighbor, and all that. But he has the depth of a puddle. <laughs> so you see sort of the naive Christian, or you might see sort of the judgmental Christian. Remember The Office and Angela? She's watching all of her coworkers, and she's judging them, and she can't believe they would say that or do that. But she also really doesn't give a reason for what she believes. She just says, it's, it's the Bible, and you have to do it, or you're bad. No depth. Today we're going to continue our series on sowing and reaping, and um, John let me pick one of the topics that was left, and so I'm really grateful that he let me take sowing and reaping in our intellectual life. I know it's a topic that John would have handled very well, and I'm grateful that he let me take it. Um, it is a little bit intimidating to preach. And you kind of wonder, why did I agree to do this? <laughs> I speak publicly through my job, so that part of it, I have the appropriate amount of nerves, but that's okay. I'm, I'm not afraid to get in front of a group anymore. But when you're talking about a spiritual topic and you're not trained, my fear would be that I would say something that's not true. And so um, it, it's in that way I just have to prepare as much as I can and give it to God. Um, plus, I know I'm among friends, um, and there's two services, so I just practice on you guys, <laughs> and then I'll do the real one at 11. But let's just um, pause and pray one, t one more time and ask God to, to fill the gaps this morning. So, Lord, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. I pray that you would speak through me, 
I have prepared to the best of my ability, and now we ask you to bring your power and bring your truth clearly in spite of me. Amen. So I heard someone say that the Bible is not a scientific textbook, but where it speaks to science, it is accurate. And this morning I would say the Bible is not strictly a psychology textbook, but where it talks about the mind, it is accurate. And in order that we base what we're going to think about today on the truth of the Bible and not just on some assumptions that I've made or thoughts that I've collected, I want to take some time to look at First, a foundation of just what does the Bible say about our mind? And we can use that to judge the rest of the stuff that I'm going to say. So it's very easy now with um, websites like Bible Gateway to do a word search. And I went this week and I looked up wisdom, knowledge, teaching, learning, studying. And I was able to comb through that pretty quickly. And it was kind of fun to see how consistent the messages are. Old Testament to New. So let me share a few of the observations and a few blips from Scripture so that we can have that as a foundation this morning. First one, can God read your mind? First Chronicles 28, the Lord searches all hearts and he understands every plan and thought. Ezekiel 11, for I know the things that come into your mind. Psalm 139, you discern my thoughts from afar. God can read our mind. He knows what we're thinking. Does God reach down and influence what's in our mind? Or is the stuff that's in here just things that we're dreaming up or things that we've heard? Exodus 36, Moses called every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill. 1 Kings 4, God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore. Or a New Testament example, Luke 24, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So God does reach in and affect what we're thinking at times. Where does knowledge come from? Where does wisdom come from? It comes from God, and we can ask him to help us understand James 1, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. 1 Kings 3, we see someone asking, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind, who is a king who wanted to lead well. Colossians 1, we see someone asking for God to help someone else understand. We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. What about when you're reading or praying and a thought pops into your head, or maybe you're just going through your day and a thought pops into your head? Did God always jam that in there? Did that come from another place? Can our mind generate its own thoughts from scratch? Nehemiah 6 No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. Proverbs 28, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. Jeremiah 23, they speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. So we can have thoughts that originate just from our own mind. How about how much control do we have about our thoughts? Are we just reacting to the things that are coming into our head, to the influences around us? How much control do we really have over that? Colossians 3, set your mind on things that are above, not things that are on the earth. We have the ability to set our mind on something. Philippians 4, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise, think about these things. We get to pick. 2 Corinthians 10, take every thought captive to obey Christ. That says to me as a thought can come, and we actually have the ability to control it and say, I'm not going to think about this. I'm going to lock it away. So we have a measure of control about what's in our mind. A couple more. 
our minds can be influenced by others around us negatively. 2 Corinthians 11, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray. 2 Corinthians 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Proverbs 14, leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. Two more. We are called to grow and mature in our mind. 1 Corinthians 14, do not be children in your thinking, be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. Hebrews 5, by this time you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice. Final one. Looking across the span of the Bible, there's a big difference between God's knowledge and God's wisdom and man's wisdom. Isaiah 55, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. 1 Corinthians 1, has not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? Uh, I, I attend here with my wife Priscilla and our four children. Just a little introduction. We've been going here about 11 years. Um, my parents have been going here for maybe 25 years, Marge and Tom. Um, my dad is the man who, through the slow, relentless rag ravages of time, I'm turning into. <laughs> but when I was a kid, my parents bought a boat. Uh, it was uh, probably the early 90s. I was about 14. Remember in the movies from the 60s or like your grandma's kitchen, the two colors that were available, puke green and puke yellow? <laughs> well, the boat was puke yellow. Uh, I think we paid $1,000 for it. My grandma was in town from Iowa, and so we hauled grandma down to the launch. We'll try out the boat for the first time. And a side note, if you need some entertainment, Go sit at the boat launch in the summer when it's busy, especially watch the people who've never backed their trailer. It's very entertaining. <laughs> we were actually able to get the boat in the water. We got Grandma settled into her seat. Dad got the boat started. And he went to hit the throttle so we could take off, and your boat's supposed to go up on plane. But just a plume of blue smoke all around the boat. It's already a hideous yellow color. And we're going about five miles an hour across the lake, and Dad's fiddling with the throttle. Grandma's trying to be a good sport, but she's fighting off the effects of carbon monoxide poisoning. <laughs> we puttered across the lake, gave up, came back. You know the launch at Mont Lake, the lake's not very wide there, but it probably took 20 minutes. We swallowed our pride, trailered the boat, and went home. My dad called the guy that sold us the boat, and he said, what's wrong with this thing? It doesn't work. And he says, you got to take the choke off. There's a little black lever by the throttle that is up when you start, and then after that you put it down and the boat takes off, so everything was fine. The point is, if you're going to operate something, you need to know how it was designed to work, or you're just going to get a lot of smoke, and it's not going to work very well. And so when I think about the mind, I'm looking for knowledge about how our mind operates, so I can I can navigate my life. And we're talking about sowing and reaping. So I want to give an illustration of the mind and consider those verses that I read and those truths that we got about psychology from God. When we're born, our mind is like a clean field ready to be planted. And as time goes by and we hear things and we think things and we read things, those ideas come in and they're like seeds. And as we think about them more and as we hear them repeated, they germinate and they grow and they take root. And things that have been there a long time have deep roots. Thoughts germinate and they become beliefs. And our beliefs affect the way we feel. They affect the way we make decisions, the way we interact with people around us. 
we start as a clean field, but through time, that field has all kinds of stuff in it. Some of the plants are in line with the truth of God's word, and others came from who knows where, and maybe they've been there a long time. Maybe you have a Russian olive with thorns all over it and no fruit that's well-rooted in your mind. We all have a mix. Now, ideally, our mind would be like a well-cared-for and ordered orchard where everything is pruned and, and it's producing good fruit, but we don't arrive at that state while we're on earth. Whether we've been intentional or not, there's still work to do. And if we haven't been intentional at all, that field could be kind of a mess. The question is, if that's how our mind works, and if we're all in some state like that, what are we to do about it, and does it even matter? I've invited Christ into my heart, and I have faith that when I die, I'll get to be with him in heaven. So what difference does it make if I sort out the mess in my head? Does it really matter? Let's talk about some of the ways that that affects us, the state of our mind and our intellect. First, for the individual, for us personally. Remember that what we believe affects the way we think and it affects the way we react to situations. And so if the, if the predominant thing in our mind is a collection of beliefs that have taken root that are not in alignment with God's truth and the way he designed us to operate, we're going to have one, set, one type of a life, one set of reactions. Here are some of the beliefs that we, we may be holding right now that aren't in line with what God has taught us. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy to be loved. I have to watch out for myself. If I open up to people and they saw who I really was, they would hate me. They would kick me out of the church. And so I've got to guard myself. What about what we think about God? Do we believe that God is far away and distant and he doesn't consider us, he doesn't care about us? Do we believe that God is angry with us? We know about our shortcomings. Do we picture him with his arms crossed looking down? Do we feel and believe, I can't pray until I fix all the weeds in my life? Is that preventing us from having a relationship with him? Let's look at a set of beliefs that does line up with the Bible and think about how that would play out in someone's life. I believe that God created me and I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I believe he has a purpose for me. He has a plan for me. When I have struggle, it doesn't mean something's wrong. I can rejoice in that because it's one of the ways that God works on me to sand off the rough edges. So I can accept the struggle of life with grace and patience. What about God designed all of us to live in community with each other? If I open up to other Christians, they will love me because they have their own struggles and they will help sharpen me and help me grow faster than I can in isolation. How about God knows me fully and loves me fully right now? like I am right now. Taking time to sort out what we believe and verify and work on the fact that we want it to line up with God's truth is important. It matters. Isaiah 26, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. God may not remove that person at work who drives you crazy and mistreats you. He may not immediately resolve your financial stress. He may not heal that health problem that is existing in your family. But when our mind and our beliefs are aligned with him, he gives us peace through that. And it matters. With the state of our mind being a mix of truth and untruth, how does that affect the church? John Wooden 
was the coach of the UCLA basketball team in the 60s and 70s. He won more championships than any college coach in history. He has 10. The next one on the list is five. So he's double the next winningest coach. And that record has stood for 50 years. Wooden passed away in 2010. He was 99 years old. But he's widely recognized as one of the most influential leaders of our time. His philosophy as a coach was he wanted every player on the team to strive to reach as close to their full potential as they could. And he held every player to that standard. He had Hall of Flame Hall of Fame players like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Walton, and he had bench warmers that we've never heard of. And he celebrated each the same based on whether or not they reached as close as possible to their full potential. This was a big part of the reason why John Wooden's teams won more games than any other team. There's a natural tendency to focus on the more visible the more exciting players, and maybe subconsciously a bit neglect the bench warmers. And Wooden didn't do that. He knew that everyone needed to be as close to their best as they could be, and it made a difference. The church is no different. We are not all just the same as each other, performing at different levels. We're all unique. The illustration that we have is that we're the body of Christ. That means that each individual is a separate part of the body, and to have a whole body, you need all the parts. Some of the parts are more visible, and they draw more attention, and some are hidden. But if a part is suffering, even the hidden part, the whole body feels it. We may think... John and Phil get paid to think about this stuff. They went to college for this stuff. They're the ones that should figure it out. Maybe Sharon, who's on staff and she leads worship, maybe Dana, maybe they should be reading and studying. But the rest of us, we're welders, we're electricians, we're school teachers. It's not our vocation. So let's let John and Phil and the staff do it. And they can tell us how to think and we'll do our thing. And then after work, we'll watch Netflix because we're tired. And on the weekend, we'll have a barbecue. Everybody in the church body has things that they're working through in life. Loneliness, anxiety, addiction, shame. When we interact with each other, if our spiritual knowledge is this deep, and we have somebody who's struggling, which we all do, if all we're able to say is, well, praise the Lord, hope it gets better, what, have we done them a disservice? What if we could say, you know, I was just reading about uh, this concept last week, and God taught me something. I want to share it with you and encourage you. Where's the depth? We miss out if we let John and Phil do all the work on the intellectual side. A great bit of wisdom could come from anybody. It doesn't just have to come from the pastor. A great piece of encouragement from God to one of our fellow community members can come through anybody. What about the young people in church? When you're a little kid, you go to Sunday school and you learn basic lessons and everything is fine. But when you get into middle school or high school, life starts to get a lot more complicated. I have two high schoolers and a middle schooler and a seven-year-old, and I'm watching this happen. They have questions. Those basic things they learned in Sunday school are being challenged every day at the high school or online with what they're seeing or what they're watching on television. When they come to us who have been here longer, who have been Christians longer, and they bring these questions, do we say, don't talk about that. Just have faith. The Bible says that's wrong. My friend thinks they might be gay. I don't know if God is real. My teacher said that if I believe in creation, I'm a fool. 
and I'm listening to myths from an, uh, an ancient book that's full of contradictions. Is this a place where they can bring those questions? And when they do, do they find that we've wrestled with them? Or have we taken the easy road and just said, I'm just going to go with the Bible and I don't need to think about it? A lot of young people are leaving the church after they graduate. Maybe that's part of the reason why. With this mix of beliefs that we have in our head, how does that affect the world outside of the church? You know, people that haven't accepted the Bible as a source of truth are not satisfied by the answer, just believe it because it's in the Bible. They're not prepared to go there. It's okay to do that. I take a lot on faith. But what about the intellectual side? When do we wrestle with that? Uh, there's a man named Ken Ham who is uh, a leader in the sort of creation space. And he and his organization have studied a lot and they've looked for evidence of creation. And uh, Bill Nye, Bill Nye the Science Guy, you remember that show? He's an atheist who is a, a prominent voice for evolution and atheism. So the two decided to have a debate a few years ago. I had uh, heard Ken Ham when I was young, and I'd heard evidence for creation, evidence for a worldwide flood, and it really strengthened my faith that I didn't just have to take it from the Bible. I could look around at the world and, and start to piece some things together. So I was really looking forward to this debate. And when it came to be Ken Ham's turn, he essentially said, well, God wrote the Bible. God knows everything. The Bible says creation's true, so it's true. And I would say that Bill Nye won the debate handily because Ken didn't bring evidence. And Bill Nye doesn't see the Bible as an authority. If, uh, if Ken had reached into all that evidence from his organization, PhDs in genetics and biology and geology and cosmology, would that have been a different outcome? Bill Nye wasn't going to change his mind. But what about the millions of people that were watching that were wondering, is there any evidence for this? I'm kind of curious about it. Were they left flat? I respect Ken Ham, but I think he missed it that day. We have the same type of thing come up when we're talking to our neighbors. A lot of time we avoid real conversation in our culture, but there are times where when we know someone well enough, we get into a real conversation. Maybe someone that we've worked with for a while and we've got some trust. Are we prepared to give an intellectual reason for the things we believe? They have not come to a place where they say, oh, it's in the Bible, I'll just take it. They're looking for answers. I heard an ex-law enforcement officer talking about the experience of being in court and seeing a lot of different juries. He said that in every trial, you have evidence, but you never have a perfect airtight body of evidence. There's always some questions left. And if you've been on a jury, there's a huge pool of jurors and they have to weed that down until there's 12 left. And he said they would ask people, are you able to make a decision even if all of your last questions haven't been answered? And if they say, no, I would be uncomfortable with that, they get rid of them. He said, we don't have perfect evidence, but we do have evidence. And he said something I thought was really profound. With the evidence that we do have, while there will still be unanswered questions, we can reduce that leap of faith to a step of faith. People may not be ready to make a leap of faith, but if we have taken the time to develop an intellectual thought about what we believe, we may be able to help them bring that down to a step. And if we haven't, we may be a barrier to someone coming to the knowledge of God because they talk to us and they find that we're no deeper than Ned Flanders. I'm going to end now with a call to action. What are we to do with the state that we find ourselves in? 
Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Understanding comes from God. His wisdom is higher than ours. We'll never fully understand it, but we can look at the evidence we have. We can ask him to help us understand more the reasons for the commands that he's given, the reasons for the truths that he has laid out. And that happens like a seed that grows. You put a seed in the ground. You put an idea or thought in the ground. It doesn't immediately pop out and produce fruit. It takes time. You've got to stay with it. You've got to water it. You've got to be patient. And what this looks like is, are we spending time reading the Bible? And I'm challenged by this. You know, one of the benefits of agreeing to do this, as much of a pain as it is, is that it forces me to do that study because I know I have to stand up here in front of you. I could do it anyway, but I generally don't. But the pressure of knowing that Sunday is coming makes me stop and read this. And through that, I spend way more time than I normally would. I'm asking God to show me the truth. I'm studying. And I'll remember this long after you guys have forgotten it because I'm the one who's stressed out and studied for it. But that's what it kind of looks like. And maybe that's the piece that, that you may be missing. It's one that I've been lax in. It doesn't mean that we're going to ignore the heart and the soul just means that our tire might have a flat spot on the intellect. When you have a flat spot on your tire, it's a bumpy ride. So the question is, we've invited Jesus into our heart. You know, uh, there's some here maybe that haven't done that, but it's most commonly what we talk about. Is it time to invite him back into our mind? A final verse. Hosea 10, 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground. For it's time to seek the Lord. That he may come and reign righteousness upon you. And the worship team can come back for the last song. And I'll close this in prayer. I am somebody who likes to learn. I enjoy reading. I apply that muscle to my career commonly, and it served me well. But I haven't applied it in my spiritual walk, and I've been convicted. And it's something that rather than just read the Bible to say that I did it out of guilt, just to blaze through it at night at the end of the day, I'm challenged to read it and sit with it and ask God, could you show me your truth? Could you help me understand what things that I believe that aren't right? And can you help reinforce the things that are right? Because it's going to affect the quality of my life. It's going to affect the church community around me. It's going to affect the world around me. If you uh, feel God speaking to you and calling you back, maybe you've gotten out of the habit or maybe you were never in it. Um, let's pray together, and then we'll do the last song. Lord, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for making us. We thank you that you offer peace when we align ourselves to your truth. We know that it's your desire to reach the world we confess that at times we have been lazy on the intellectual side and we may have missed opportunities. We ask you to forgive us, put that behind us, help us look forward, help us to have the discipline to do the work, even if we don't have the deadline of talking in front of a group. Help us to have the patience to see those ideas grow, germinate, take root, and become deeply held beliefs that affect us and the people around us. Amen.